Um, okay. Um, well, first of all, congratulations on a tremendous resource. Um, I did notice that here in, um, in the ODI, most people are holding the summary uh, report, and I'm going to refer to the overview and the main book, the main report here. Um, and I would urge you to look at the main report, because some of my comments are on, on whether the summary does justice to what's in here, and if not, why. Um, I mean, the report um, in the overview, and I'll move between the two, um, has enormous breadth. Um, and I think, importantly, what it does do is make a case for the social and the socially excluded not to be in its own dedicated space and attended to by social development actors, but in fact to be everyone's concern. And it does that very forcefully and very strongly by covering, covering this vast array of topics that um, you've heard about. Um, an enormously uh, diverse range of examples <coughs> from the current and emerging middle classes feeling excluded from political space and from the obvious economic prosperity, which Ricardo's referred to, to the exclusion of rich homosexuals in any country, to poor indigenous peoples, to women excluded and multiple in intersecting domains. And so my immediate question, well, does the analytical framework actually, can it cope with this diversity? Um, and you might expect it to become analytically disjointed, but I think the framework holds together well. And my view is, is this is in part because conceptually, I think inclusion and exclusion are probably better covered in the literature than many other social concepts. And I think that they are actually more widely understood than many um, other social concepts, such as social cohesion or um, even participation. I think that there, there is the possibility of actually Im understanding what inclusion and exclusion means. And so they're practically useful concepts to engage with. And so th in the first category, which, the, uh, which is in the book, um, what and how, it identifies markets, services and spaces. And initially I felt that was very dry, very World Bankish. Um, but actually, it covers vast areas, um, and the spaces really bails you out because <laughs> you can put a lot in space. Um, so from indigenous land rights, language exclusion in schools, restricted banking services, exclusion from labor markets, political voice for adolescents, it does fit into that. And the second framing, asking how and what to improve, um, identifies ability, opportunity, <coughs> and dignity. And it's similarly, it's very big in scope. I think that it does uh, touch some very important areas. Um, enabling disabled access, promoting human rights, um, accessible transport and infrastructure, education for all can fit into those, those areas. And the final framing of areas of importance I felt began to get to the core, the attitudes and perceptions and the exclusionary forces which are at the root of the problem. They quote Virginia Woolf, um, the eyes of others are prisons, their minds are cages. And I began to sense some reach for a sort of final solution um, and in the summary, <coughs> um, I felt I was in danger of losing the thread by the time I got to this point, um, because it does then get to what I see as the fundamental issue, which I think is the core thread running through all of this, and that is the negotiation and distribution of power. And it finally identifies this in one detailed case study, the poor health of tribal women, which was mentioned in the presentation, rooted in the low power she has relative to everyone else in the country. And that's on page 27 of the 30-page report. And thereafter, her empowerment and power relations are mentioned several times as core to her being healthy. What I felt the report didn't do was then refer that back to the framework overall, which it could easily have done, um, to the way in which she um, could benefit from the market services and spaces. Uh, <coughs> um, and so I, I felt some uncertainties at this stage. Um, I think the summary could and should do much more. So several important challenges are alluded to, inequality being one, people's disengagement from political processes, dis disillusionment from exclusion from economic gains. It's not clear in the summary, but it is mentioned in the report, and there's, quite a, there's a section on inequality that which infers that inequality does matter. Um, so the summary does a disservice, I think, to the main report. And having finally found the issue of power being articulated, I looked back through the summary, and it was mentioned about five times. Um, the more powerful state power, education changing the relations of power, intrafamily power, individuals' feelings of powerlessness, empowerment, and then the case study. And for me, negotiating power is actually at the center of social inclusion issues, and it's vital that this is made transparent. 
So if you take labour markets, if inclusion is the aim, then a labour market where good representation of women is to be found could be taken as inclusion, and indeed in, in the report is in some, in some places. Um, but where women are powerless, paid poor wages, and adversely incorporated, they remain excluded. If they had power and equal say on their inclusion, that would be on equal terms. In the main text, the issue of women's participation participation in the labour force is considered in relation to discriminatory attitudes towards it. Um, and increased participation in the labour force is seen to drive norm change, which it can do. But it's women's power and control over the, their terms and conditions that actually represents inclusion and drives change. Similarly in the household, if women are denied land rights, then legislating and enforcing the implementation of that legislation is good policy, it looks like good policy, it is good policy, but women actually have to claim and enact their rights. They have to be empowered to make use of the legislation and within the household they have to feel they can claim and enact this power without fear. So the report identifies this, but I don't think it makes enough of it. Within the main text there's quite good material on power, discussion on the internalisation of empowerment, on positive perceptions, feelings of participation, belonging and being respected in society to promote self-esteem and a sense of security. That's real empowerment. They discuss Foucault and Bourdieu's analysis of power in relation to many dimensions, including the availability and the use of political space and knowledge. So it does refer to quite a lot of very important issues around power. And I would like to suggest that this is a central theme but I'm not convinced that the authors see it as such. If it's to drive home the centrality of this issue, then in the summary where it says there are winners and losers, rather than leave the reader hanging as to who the losers are and how they lose, it should identify that the losers are those who have to relinquish power and authority over <coughs> others. I think one other area which is perhaps a little loosely covered is the debate on social norm change. This term is increasingly a catch-all for different understandings. Um, in my view, it refers to formal and informal laws, norms and practices, but I don't think it's consistently treated in the report. Um, there's a lot of reference to stigma, stereotyping, attitudes and perceptions, and I think there could be a bit more explanation um, and clearer definitions of what social norms are and how they may be reinforced and changed over time. Some of the um, examples are not wholly convincing. So the changing of, of practices such as foot binding in China were competently but arguably not convincingly covered. Um, again, it's about the negotiation of power. Foot binding may have been abandoned. It's a hugely important change for women. But did this lead to the empowerment of women? Was foot binding replaced by another type of binding or bondage? So these comments, rather than just being a criticism, are actually asking for more. I overall think it's a very rich report, and it's well worth looking at the main report. Um, it's immensely comprehensive. It does, I think, excellent service to the issue of social inclusion by pointing out that everyone is excluded, exclusion is everywhere, that all actors must consider, consider it, and it challenges complacency. It says not to be content with the knowledge that certain groups are overrepresented among the poor or that some have worse human development outcomes, but rather asking why this is the case. And it clearly states that change is possible. Exclusion is not embedded in culture and immutable. So it's definitely good to be left with a feeling of wanting more rather than less. And um, I really look forward to seeing how it plays out in the bank. I think it's a really important piece of work.